We now move on to the next Sky Talk that is presented by L3 Security and Detection System, who also sponsored the coffee break. So I'd like to make that clear as well. I would like to invite now to the lectern uh, an old friend of ICAO, William McGann, who is Vice President and General Manager of L3 Security and Detection Systems. So Bill, the floor is yours. Thank you. And watch the tie. Thank you very much. Um, well, everyone's revitalized after the break. Um, so continuing with the theme of uh, reimagining the aviation security checkpoint, we're going to take a slight variation on that theme and focus on the shift um, from technology to products to ultimately capabilities and talk about that shift from the perspective of a very natural driver that gets us there, namely us as the passenger. And by injecting us as the passenger into the native security architecture, we really can see how the transformation to a frictionless screening system will come about. So let's begin. Um, we're going to start by talking about travel because it's one of these you know concepts you can have a lot of definitions and we really broke it down to its simplest element and namely that travel is driven simply by a human need for physical presence I mean I don't want to get into the economics and demographics of global expansion of middle classes it's happening and everybody up here throughout the day has said that in so many ways the trick is to tie and tightly align all the security advancements whether they be operational standards development technology development to the native passenger as part of the security architecture that from the architecture perspective is open connected and secure that is also what everyone is talking about up here today so we want to create this alignment and we sort of we thought we'd just have some fun today and break the problem down into a few steps we're going to talk about this transformation from the perspective of what are some of the key drivers we're going to talk about it from the perspective of what are some of the disruptive forces when you go through this transformational change because they create both challenges and opportunities for the policymakers, the regulators, the people that provide products and services to the industry, all of the above have the opportunity to change. We're going to spend a little bit of time and try to say, hey, this is what, you know, success might look at like someday. And finally, because ultimately <laughs> I am a technology guy, I couldn't get away with this talk without introducing some technology talk about some of the enabling technologies that might help as the underpinning of this transformation so remember the focus of this talk is embedding the passenger as native to the architecture and if your mind makes that shift simply that you've already begun to stop abstracting technology and thinking more about capabilities and if you look at what some of the drivers are I mean they're here today with us I mean people are already starting to think about services migrating the service away from a product or into into a passenger and thinking about creating new experiences for those services I mean my goodness I mean most of the best shopping malls in the world today are in the largest uh, in expanding international airports I mean I do most of my shopping in international airports these days I mean, they're fantastic experiences of course getting through security is sort of one of the fundamental challenges that we're going to focus on so these drivers are creating pressures for all of us as participants in this industry and I call the pressures adaptive pressures. So let's break them down a little bit. We, we kind of are familiar with all of them. So we talked about the first one on the upper right about the you know, rapid growth of passenger travel around the world and, and another old familiar uh, friend of ours is that there are always budgetary constraints. I mean I've been participating in this industry since 1989 when I started my first company and uh, you know budgetary constraints have always been present always and they always will be and the third you know a little term in the equation up there in the top bar is really another I wouldn't call it an old friend but how many times have we encountered new threats as driving our reactive behavior as an industry it's ever present it's always an asymmetric challenge to our business I mean we spend tens and hundreds of millions of dollars 
building countermeasures to a set of threats or even sometimes a single threat and, and for a few mere tens of thousands of dollars the next threat can be created. So both from an impact point of view and from a countermeasure point of view we live in a very asymmetric threat environment. And when you put these things together in this very linear sequential fashion like how we've evolved you create this very inefficient set of workflows which arguably might equal frustration. So we want to break this problem down and look at the transformational elements of every single one of these and talk about the new architecture for security, some of the disruptors that we may or may not be able to take advantage of but at a minimum recognize, and then figure what is a new business model for the industry and what are the enabling technologies that get us there. And what I would dare say if we do all those things really well, we could perhaps define success as a new frictionless, connected, open, and secure architecture for screening. So let's talk about the architecture. So um, this is kind of a fancy cartoon. We actually are using this kind of a statistical model where we're building up an architecture in layers. And anybody that's done software architecture, this is not news, right? So the underlying technology layer is something that we've lived with for decades. This is the stuff that we, as L3 and Rapiscan and Smiths and Nuketech, everybody we develop detection technologies. These are the underpinnings, the technology layer of our architecture, right? don't need to say a whole lot more about that. That's been established. The middle layer, the operational layer, is really what I would em encourage us all to think about as the CONOPS, the interaction of that technology with the screeners. And we talked about the importance of always having human screeners in the security process at some point. We can optimize their efficiency and maybe minimize their number in some cases. However, they'll always be present. And that very important operational layer is where we will start to maximize efficiencies by focusing on this new architecture. Now, the reason why this is a cartoon is that that top layer, the social architecture, us, it don't exist today. I mean, let's really be honest and step back. We today as passengers travel more or less as victims through the current security process, right? I mean, we I mean, you know, I'm being somewhat facetious about it, but it's really true. I mean, we don't have a, a seat at the table, and yet most of the emphasis is how do I create a passenger? Well, you might want to involve the passenger as somehow being more native to the architecture itself, and it might actually change how you get there. So one of the things that we're doing is trying to address this top layer because once you create this top social layer and that's what all that modeling in the in the cartoon box is we're using very simple statistical modeling methods to based on the amount of real estate at a particular checkpoint figure out the FIFO buffering and the statistical variations of throughputs of different instruments but we're not thinking about them as technologies they're abstracted they're abstracted providers of data which we turn into information right and so the reason why the social architecture in the native pasture is so important because it will go and fundamentally transform those other two layers underneath it. I don't want anyone to walk away with saying, oh, well, once we define the social native passenger architecture, we can just use the stuff we have. Oh, no. It, it's going to all have to change. It'll all have to change in order to become a holistic abstraction of technology. So ultimately, what you're going to have is a bunch of <laughs> so, some of the instrument developers, I can say this because I am an instrument developer, you know, they, they're going to hate this because they're going to spend, you know, $25 million developing a CT technology and I'm going to say, it's going to become an edge device on a network. It's not any different than a video camera that costs a hundred bucks. And we spend five, ten million dollars developing the next high resolution ETD. It's an abstracted edge device. And by the way, I'm going to integrate it into the lane so you'll never even see it ever again. Oops. So we're going to really abstract the technology to a point where it will be effective, it will be highly connected in an open architecture. And this is some of the challenges that the panel was talking about. I mean, oh, I almost wanted to jump up, but I mean, it was very, very fascinating to listen to all this. And by the way, I don't really think that there is, I love it, I don't love it. It's happening. We don't have a choice. It's going to happen to us if we don't recognize that it's coming. And as leaders, and I suspect all of us in some ways in this room are leaders in our own right, a leader's job is to see around the next corner. And this corner is coming quickly. So let's talk about some of the disruption. 
and, and I call this blurring the boundaries because there's some good and there's some bad to it. There's a real convergence between what do you mean by service? Well, today, it's like if I build an x-ray machine, I sell it and I get a five or a 10 year service contract or an ETD machine or a body scanning machine. No, no, no. A service today is more like a web-based service that you, you know, when you buy a seat on a network and you have a directory of resources that you can license services for your use and produce the reports and produce the data for your, your, your consumption and to produce analyses to make your processes, whatever they might be, secure, security included, more efficient. So the convergence of transforming from a product-minded service to a more web-based service where all these abstracted, really powerful technologies, I mean, these technologies will always be innovative, they will always be new IP, they'll always be on the cutting edge, but they're going to be abstracted from the security, ultimately the passenger layer. Let's talk about the next one because it's, it's one of the challenges I think was alluded to in some of the, uh, some of the surveys. You know, we, we coin it co-opetition. I, I, we didn't, L3, create that term. We probably stole it from somebody else at some point along the line. It's commonly used. Um, the, the, I don't think that General Motors and Chrysler Corporation today compete on the core technology for a transmission. Just saying. Or a fuel injector for that matter. I mean, they differentiate their offering by the experience that the driver of their car, the lines of the car, the man-machine interface, the navigation system, the interior, it, how the car handles on the road, all these things. And yeah, while the transmission and the fuel injector have a lot to do with the underpinning of how that, that car performs, they actually cooperate in common designs for these core technologies. It would be pretty interesting to get L3, NukeTech, RapScan, and Smith together and say, hey guys, let's create a new CT detector module. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Just admire how long, so that's a challenge. That's a big rock that we have to move. Or, hey, um, where's Dave Atkinson? Hey, let's design a standard high resolution IMS drift tube. A standard that everybody uses. Because then, you know, writing the transfer function for the data to produce the right amount of information or mapping of the libraries of what you're trying to detect becomes a lot more straightforward. And if you're confident that you're an innovator, you can still be very successful. It, you don't have to own every bit of intellectual property because as our industry matures, you know, in the 1990s, it was really important to talk about your science, right? In the, year, in the 2000s, it was really important to talk about your products. And, you know, in the last part of this decade, now we're talking about sustainability of a very large fleet of, of, of systems out there in the field and how those services are going to be rendered going forward. It's a completely different game already. So our view is to cooperate somehow with our competition. And, you know, I, I kind of joke around with some of my colleagues here for the last 28 years, like, you want, you, want, you want to see how my algorithm works? I'll, I'll show it to you because I've already got the next one going. I mean, may, maybe, we can, you know, maybe we can figure some of these real problems out together. And it really, it's a little bit scary, but you know, if you're confident with what you're doing, it really does work. The, the next element, which I want to dwell upon, are the services. Um, so, and, and best way to describe it, I think, is how many of us 10 years ago, right, would have imagined that it would be really acceptable to stand in line every day for about five or ten minutes just for the privilege of spending five dollars for a cup of coffee, yeah? I mean, I grew up in a household, my father was a coffee salesman. If he ever knew I paid five dollars for a cup of coffee, he'd roll over in his grave, right? So, I mean, it's crazy, and yet we all do it. And why do we do it? Because it's a service that we love. We go to the place. We buy coffees for our friends. We, we get points on our app every time we buy a coffee. You know, every time a passenger goes through an L, 10 times through an L3 body scanner and 14 times through a CT imager, and you can figure out why it's 10 and 14 test for the audience, um, I'm going to give them a credit. What does that security credit look like? I have no idea. But I mean, a People love this kind of stuff, right? So you want to engage the passenger as part of your security environment. Have them opt in. So what does a new value proposition look like? In brief, it could be many things. One of the things that we're kind of enamored with is, um, is a fee-for-service kind of model. It was a little bit touched upon. It's not renting. This is like, you know, 
we can set up a checkpoint. You can have any third party equipment you like. If you like our body scanner, great. If you like somebody else's, fine. If you like rapid scan x rays, get them from DPAC. We'll, we'll put them in for you. You know, whatever you want to do. We want to build the security architecture. We want to tightly integrate those edge devices. And I have a little cartoon. We, we use something called Mac Secure in, in our space. It is an open architecture platform. It basically is written around an abstraction layer for the devices, a communication layer for the devices to put information into, a transport layer that sends that information on a common protocol to a box. That box we call an event action engine. So asynchronously, these devices are sending up events into the transport layer, into the box. The box is making decisions and putting out actions. Did you ever see an ETD or CT machine? No. But what you have is integrated security. That's what we mean by an open architecture that is connected and secure. I'm not really touching on the cyber piece. It's huge, and I don't want to underestimate that. But not enough time to go into that. It's a real focus. So this is kind of our vision of what success might look like. Um, and I have to talk a little bit about some of the enabling technologies. And people have touched on the machine learning. It's, by the way, not new. Uh, the picture that I show on the upper right with the neural nets, the sort of uh, nodes of dots and with connections to them, the, the upper one, the simplest one with three layers, that's been around since the 1980s. In fact, in 1990, um, I was actually part of a design team in a startup company where we built a handheld explosive detector and some of you here will remember this, Lino will, I know, it was two little gas chromatography columns connected to these weird little devices called electron capture detectors. And we took the information flowing through these columns in real time and we put them through what's called a back propagating neural net and it actually worked. We were actually able to train that system using a back propagating neural net as depicted in that first one in the upper right. It didn't work great. We ended up not being able to make, because we didn't have enough, who said it, data to get the system to generalize in the real world. We could get it to work with our training set really well, but data, when you do artificial intelligence, is, is really the crucial part. If you really want to have a robust solution, you need to be able to have the system learn or generalize in its native environment. So that was what the defect was. Now, the one next to it, which we call a deep learning network, which today, depending on which algorithms you choose, can maybe have up to 300 hidden layers. These things are incredibly powerful, and incredibly powerful. And we're actually seeing that there's somewhat of an inversion, though I don't believe it yet, that you can almost, they're, they're so dense that you can almost start using less data. I'll, I'll be a believer when I really can prove that out. But in any event, the point is progress will be made in this space. And the question is, are we going to do it sequentially and go 30 meters at a time? Or are we going to go around the world 25 times with the same, same 30 steps exponentially? That's really the message. So success will be when all these security components tie to one event action engine. Doesn't have to be mine. My event action engine is an open architecture. It will play with anybody's. It will just be another API to connect in. Um, we need to redefine that security passenger relationship. We want to leverage this um, open architecture. And, re and I, I refer to it as SEMS, but that's just our version of it. It stands for Security Efficiency Management System. And, and so finally, as we get there, I mean, we, we talk a lot about this, but this is really an important chart. It's kind of a throwaway in some ways, but this cannot happen without everybody in the community. The airport operators, the policy makers, the regulators, the equipment providers, the service providers, everybody. Baggage handling system people. And we're going to have to break down some of the natural barriers that are us by definition, by evolution, because the world is changing and we need to adapt. Um, so the journey's already begun. I mean, this, this cartoon was a picture that L3 drew, actually before I joined L3. Um, and today, those are actual real pictures of checkpoints in, like this in operation. So it's already happening. And, and is it happening to the full extent as I've described? No, of course not. But these initial steps are already taking place around the world. And so a quick glimpse is you're going to have tailored security. It's going to be tightly integrated with a passenger being native to it. 
Notice I have the guards in there. The, the humans are still involved in the process of security. It will be continuous or perhaps frictionless flow. And again, once again, connected, open, and secure. Um, with that, I'd like to thank you and say we think this is an important transformation uh, as a process for growth in our industry. It's the only way I think we're going to be able to keep up with the burgeoning demand of air travel for whatever the reasons are. We need to redefine the architecture and we need to transform our business processes. And when we do that, we will have a much stronger industry. We will be able to extend that beyond the borders, the bounds of the boundary conditions of aviation. There are many other corollary industries like prisons, borders, embassies around the world, every place, right? And there's a very, very uh, important upstream uh, model here that we don't have enough time to go into today where you actually start working with the people that design airports. So with that, thank you very much for your kind attention and I'll pause.